There was a lady, and this is a, this is, uh, I'm telling you it's a true story ahead of time because it doesn't seem possible. But I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story that will kind of go where the title of this message is leading us. A lady, an uh, older lady, she was going to her doctor for an annual checkup. And this lady was a very healthy lady. She was in her mid-80s, and she was good. She was uh, very fit and active. She would go on, uh, enter into marathons and do all these sorts of things, and very, very active. She came to her doctor and, and for this annual checkup, and the doctor was really concerned about how much activity she was actually exerting. And he cautioned her and asked her and, and gave her some information, some guidance, that maybe she ought to just back down a little bit and, and not exert herself so much. And so she left the doctor's office and she began heeding his advice. Several months later, at her funeral... The doctor was noted as saying this, I could have cut my tongue out for ever having told her to be careful to stop exerting herself. I doubt that I would ever give that advice again, especially to older people who are enjoying life as she was. You and I have received good counsel and we have received bad counsel in our life. Is that to be the case or not? We will continue to have that throughout our journey in life. It's just the part of it. But as we think about Job and the counsel that he was given, I introduced to you those three friends, those initial friends to Job two weeks ago. Three friends two weeks ago. <laughs> Don't want to reverse that. And I, and I kind of give you a little bit of their background. And as you think about those people, as you think about those friends and the things that they will be saying for the next several weeks, I'm going to be talking about that advice. They are going to be giving this poor man, poor man in every sense of the word, some advice that's not so good. They're going to be critical. They are going to perceive things and ridicule him and actually portray to him something in their legalistic mindset, their understanding, something that is going to be very kind of detrimental to Job. I want to just suggest to you these three men, and keep this in the back of your mind, maybe make a mental note or a written note, that these three men are coming from a, a different, each one of them, different type of uh, philosophy. And through their philosophical system, they are going to be giving Job some poor advice. Let me just share with you those three, these three friends. Eliphaz, he's going to be sharing with Job in advising him from the experiential sense. Bildad, from the traditional sense. And so far, so far probably the most critical of them all, is going to draw assumptions and begin to give Job counsel from that aspect. So keep those in mind, and I'll remind you as we are going through these different people uh, and their advice. I'm going to just bring that back up to you over the next several weeks. But as you think about these three men, how would you deal with that? How would you deal with somebody, as you are going through difficulties in your life, suffering in your life, how would you deal with counsel such as what they had. Well, it wouldn't be easy. And so we're going to be picking up some, some very significant things as we talk about them. I think it would also be helpful for you to keep in mind as we go through this book, uh, maybe you've read Job, maybe you haven't, and from here on out, it's very poetic literature. From here all the way up until the very last 11 verses that changes back to more of... Um, a uh, traditional type of writing, such as a newspaper writing. So I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I'm just going to give you snippets down through the, uh, the chapters just to give you an idea of what these men are portraying to him, advising him, and Job's response back to them. As a matter of fact, there are three cycles in this book. Not motorcycles, by the way. Cycles. Eliphaz will chime in and give his advice to Job. Job will respond. 
Bildad will chime in, give his advice. Job will respond. So far, we'll, we'll speak, and then Job will respond. Three cycles, three times this will happen throughout the book. And throughout these cycles, we are going to learn some significant things along the way. And so I'm, I'm kind of anxious to uh, show you these things, but I don't want to be too anxious and just kind of fly through the book. We want to gather as much information as we can. So this morning, we're going to talk about Elphaz. And uh, we're going to talk about what he, his initial counsel to Job. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Job chapter 4. If you're using the chair Bibles, it's on page 418. As Eliphaz will begin to talk to Job, he's going to be coming in, uh, sharing some things that are accurate to some extent, but yet he's also going to mix it with his experiential philosophy. You'll hear this as I go through. Job chapter 4. As we look at this passage, he's going, to be, he's going to be sharing with Job something that's, well, I think everybody knew. Everybody that was in existence around Job knew that Job was a great man. He was a godly man, and he, and he shared his life freely with people around him, even from the advice category. From, from the godly man coming to people that were hurting and suffering, and he would lend them advice. And here's Eliphaz is going to begin talking to Job to say, you know what, you've spent your life pouring out to people, advising them, counseling them, now it's time for you to sit there and listen to us. Yes and no. It was kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, he needed to sit there and listen, but did he really need to heed their advice? (laughs) You see what I'm saying? Job is going to hear this man speak from... uh, a perspective where that is a logic and something that is very, um, uh, I'm missing a word here, something that, Job, this is an experience that you had and it's logical that you have lived your life in this way and now life is treating you this way, that automatically should cause you to think something needs to change. That's logic. It's good logic, right? If I'm, if I'm pounding a nail with a hammer, and all of a sudden I hit my thumb, I don't say, okay, I'm going to continue to hit in that direction. I'm going to say, it's time to move the position of the hammer and start hammering where it needs to be hammered, right? That's very simple. All right? I need to think simply because uh, that's the way I am. Simple. simple. Not a simple tin, though. <laughs> so here's... here's uh, Elphe is saying, Job, you need to change something. You had a wonderful, prosperous life, beautiful family, healthy, and now you live like this. Something needs to change, right? And he's, he's directing Job into a direction in which isn't going to be good information. In verse 6, as you come down to verse 6, actually verse 5 and verse 5, five and 6, Job is going, or Elphaz is going to be saying this, But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence and the integrity of your ways your hope? You know, you, maybe you're not the person that we think that you were. You know, you had this very public life and people knew when you went out into the world and when you went, when you went out into the commerce areas and people knew their integrity and saw something, but maybe you're something different. When you go in your house and you close that door, I don't, we don't know what you're doing in there. And we don't know, but God knows, and maybe you're reaping exactly what you have sown, which he is going to be saying here in a later argument. But here he is talking about this justice system that's going to prevail. And, and it's very logical, his case that he builds against Job. You are getting what you deserve. If I go to the bank, and I take a gun in there, and I say, stick them up, give me all your money, and they give me $100,000, and I walk out, and I get in my car, and I start heading to I-86, and all of a sudden the red lights are flashing, helicopters are flying over my car, and they pull me over, and they yank me out of the car, slap the cuffs on me, take me to jail, and then I, I go and I stand before a court, and I'm thrown in jail for the next 150 years. That's sort of, I get what I deserve, right? 
You rob a bank, you are going to pay the consequences. Job, you are getting exactly what you deserve, and nothing short of it. And so here's, here's what he's saying. Here's what he's going to be saying. And who suffers without deserving it? Who suffers? And look at the verse 7 and 8. It says just that. Remember, who was, who was it that, who was the innocent ever, who, who was it that the innocent ever, ever was put, perished? Or who was the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity will sow trouble, reap, will sow trouble, reap the same. So if you're going to sow trouble, you will reap that very same thing. And I'm telling you, this is the way it is. This is the general rule. And now I'm taking this template and I'm setting it over top of your life because I have the experience. I, I know that if you do this, you will reap that. And it always works. Always, always, always. And it's my experience. And this is my philosophy. And there it is. Take that, Job. Is that really the case? Can we really put a dogmatic statement on such a, a life as such as Job, or maybe one of you? Is it always like that? Who really suffers without deserving it? This is what he's saying. Well, how about martyrs? Do they suffer? What about them? And do they really deserve it? Or how about the innocent victims of abuse and murder? Do they deserve it? Is there something that they did, even those innocent little children that are abused and murdered, those sorts of things? So Eliphaz's point was not correct. It was in a general way, but not you cannot use that across the board. How about Jesus himself? The coming Messiah, as Job would see it. Was Jesus, did he deserve what he got? Well, certainly not. We need to understand that as we ourselves are receiving advice. Eliphaz was not totally incorrect, though. If you drop down to chapter 5, verse 7, and he says, But a man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. And that's one of the, 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 the verses I have underlined in my Bible, because that really is the truth, isn't it? We have trouble in this life. Does anyone here not have trouble? If you raise your hand, that is trouble. Because you don't know what you're talking about. There's trouble across the board. Even when you're a a youngster, there's trouble. There really is. And he's absolutely correct. We are born into this world full of troubles. (laughs) But Job, he was listening to this man and using his template, his experiential template of general guidelines and placing it over Job. And, and he's just saying that this is the way it is. And so you did something, Job, to really upset God, to really mess up your life, and now you are reaping the consequences. You know, Job is sitting there listening to this, and he could have hollered out, and he could have, said to, he could have easily said to Eliphaz, Eliphaz, I know that God is wonderful. I know that He is an amazing God, and I know that He's full of so many incredible things. He is awe-inspiring, awesome God. I know that to be true. I know that, and I live my life following Him and obeying Him, but I'm enduring this suffering. I'm in this intensity of the pain, and and uh, not just the mental, and also the spiritual, uh, but also the, the physical. Here was a man just racked with all kinds of sores from the, from the tip of his fingers to the tip of his toes. And he was full of these sores that no matter where, if he stood up, if he sat down, if he laid down, it was intensified pain. And even as the, even as the sores would break open, all kinds of insects would be flying around him and, and doing, making nests and things into those wounds. And it just, it just kind of a grotesque sight with, Little worms crawling out of the infections. And, and those are the things that happened, that were happening to Job. And yet, you, Eliphaz, you stand there and you think you know the mind of God? <laughs> Who do you think that you are? I am suffering here and I want answers. I, I just need answers. I need peace more than anything else. And you stand and put your experiential template over me and really think that you know the answers. Eliphaz, though, he, he had it figured out. 
he, he didn't want to hear anything from Job, and I think Job knew that he was already set in his mind. I know what the best thing is. Job, if you just simply repent, if you just simply turn from your sin, whatever you did, I don't even know what it was, just repent right now. Go ahead, get down on your knees and repent. I know it hurts your knees because your sores, and everything, but just get down and repent and ask God to forgive you, and He will forgive you, and then you can live and you can have that life, well, as good as it can get. I know you lost all those things, but just do those things. And theologically, this guy scored a 10 out of 10. He was right on. If he had a star, he put it on his forehead. He was correct, absolutely, and we preach these things even here. We need to repent of our sins, and we need to ask God to forgive us of our sins, and we, and we, place our, 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 we place our lives at His mercy, and He extends to us grace. And so Eliphaz was correct on that, and yet he was scored a zero in understanding. He didn't understand. He was correct theologically, but wrong in how he used that understanding of theology and placed it over top of Job's life. Let me just give you this note here, just to kind of summarize what I just said. People are in the midst of their deep suffering and hurt. And don't need someone to throw around theological punches. But they need a loving friend full of sympathy and comfort. And that's really what these men started out doing. But somehow something got sideways, something twisted up, and they heard and they thought they understood, and they used their philosophy, lay it on Job, and caused more grief and more anxiety. And if this is the way you were going to be as a friend, can I just be blunt with you? Can I just be honest with you? If you can't do that, then please stay home. You know, they started out with good intentions, and maybe they should have just stayed home, or just kept their mouth shut. (laughs) And yet, they pour out these things and made it worse on Job more now than ever. So as we continue to think about this conversation, Job is going to respond as we get into verse 1 of chapter 6, I've got to move my bookmark. Actually, verse 2. Oh, that my vexation were weighed, and all my calamity laid in the balances. <laughs> hey, let's review a little bit here, Eliphaz. You know what I went through. You know all of the losses that I had. All of the financial loss, and that, you know, finances are finances. And I, you can recoup those things, and that's one thing, but it was a lot of work. I did a lot of work at establishing all of these herds and all of this wealth, and, but yet that went down the tubes. The servants, those, those people that guarded my sheep, the, those people that guarded the, and watched over the camels, all of those servants, they're all gone. And in the amount, my, my family is all gone except for my wife. And now I'm aching from head to toe. If you were to take all that vexation and place it on a scale, go ahead, Eliphaz, do that. Put it on a scale and weigh it out. And put on the other side of the scale all the sand that's available. Go ahead, weigh it out. Go ahead, see how it weighs. Notice, if you will, he uses sand. And I was going to do something real clever. I was going to find the weight of sand, and I was going to bring some sand up here and, and that sort of thing. But I, I just ran it simply ran out of time. But think about sand a little bit. It doesn't take a whole lot of thought to think about this. Sand. What, what is so significant about sand in this analogy? The fact that there's two things that's very relevant about sand that he brings into this analogy. First of all, sand is plentiful. It's so plentiful that it's cheap. It's really, really cheap. You can go anywhere and get sand for next to nothing. So it's very plentiful, and secondly, it's very weighty. So, it's it's no mystery, no surprise that he would use this in this analogy. All of this plentiful sand... And all of this weighty, plentiful sand, and put it on the scale. Go ahead, weigh it out. Weigh out the millions of tons of sand that's available on this earth. Put it on the scale and weigh it against my vexation that I had in life, that I have in life. And you will see that my vexation far outweighs the sand. That's a lot. (laughs) 
That is a tremendous amount. And, I, and that's exactly where this man is at. In verse 10, <coughs> in that second half of the verse, he said, I have not denied the words of the Holy Spirit. I've been completely obedient. Anything that He's commanded, anything that He's led me, I have not denied the words of the Holy Spirit. Am I confused? Yes. Am I angry? Yes, very much so. I, because I don't understand. I'm in complete darkness of what's going on in my life. I don't understand that all I know is the pain is racking my body and my mind so tremendously. I am at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the pit. And I just can't. I just can't understand things. And so what you heard in chapter 3 from me is exactly where I am at. You need to understand the deep, dark depression that I am in, and I'm just being completely honest. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not defending myself. I just want peace. In verse 30, he challenges the man, Eliphaz, If there's any deceit, any injustice on my tongue, I want you to point it out. Anything. All I was doing is just being completely clear of the depth of my despair and depression. So we really have quite an interesting situation here. First chapter 7, the last chapter we're going to talk about, he continues to make the case before others and also God. Now more than ever, because of Eliphaz, because of the, the things that he piled upon Job and his, and his uh, experiential philosophy. He piles that, he heaps that upon him, stating that that is the problem with Job. And now he has that to contend with. And so now more than ever, he wants God, he needs God to intervene into his life. But yet, silence continues to come. Nothing. He hears nothing. And yet that even piles up more vexation upon the man. This man is in desperate ways. And as we come to the very end of the chapter, verse 20, the second half of the verse, he tells his audience, actually to God, and the audience was listening to him, why have you made me your mark? Why have I become a burden to you? God, I have this bullseye on my back. And all of the arrows in the world seem to land right on me. Why can't you dispense those arrows out among people and that way it won't be so harsh? Maybe once you give Eliphaz a couple arrows, (laughs) he might deserve it. Uh, But really, why are all the arrows pointing on me? Look at these three friends, healthy and prosperous, and their their families are all intact. And I've got nothing. I've got nothing. And I'm suffering, and I can't endure. I need peace. And yet this man continues to be humiliated by Eliphaz's words and tortured by God's silence. And he continues to crawl along on the journey. You know what you do when you crawl. You ever been down so far where you can't walk? I mean, really, I, I've had back issues in the past, and uh, I've been just dropped to my knees. I can't walk. I can't even stand up. And if I had to go into the, to point B from point A, I had to crawl very slowly. Why was that? The pain kept me down. The suffering that I was enduring kept me down. And there's no way that I could get up. And so the only way that I could move forward was to move one leg very carefully forward. And then the other knee. And then the hands very slowly moving forward. And so this is a picture that Job is continuing to do as he moves on from Eliphaz's words. Critical words, mind you. Two things I want to share with you this morning about this first cycle of Eliphaz. First of all, sometimes people's words intensify the hurt. Would anybody agree with that? (laughs) They don't mean to be that way, not necessarily. Sometimes they're our friends. You find that a lot, like at funerals. (laughs) Maybe you've been the recipient of those words. Or maybe you've been the recipitor. Did I say that right? 
Somebody rescue me? Yeah, thank you. I got a nod. We'll go with that. And sometimes, you ever walk, ever go to a funeral of your good friend, and you, you, maybe there's their spouse or the family, and you, you know, what do you say at funerals? You're always at loss to say the right words. And you wish that somehow you had a, a silver tongue that you could just bellow out something and bring great comfort to the family. And how many times do you walk away? How many times have I walked away and I said, you idiot, you said that was so stupid. I hope they don't remember that because that was just miserable. I've been there, maybe you haven't, but I've been there. And, and, or maybe you, know, you go to a hospital and you're trying to bring comfort and then you say this wrong thing. Or maybe you've been the one on the other side of things and you say, boy, that was really stupid what they said. Do they really mean that? And so you need to understand when we communicate with one another, sometimes the intensity, the t- <laughs> I should be very careful how I'm throwing different words around. The, in- the intensity of the words can be very, very potent, very potent. And we need to, be, we need to watch how we are communicating, me more than others, because you know how I twist my tongue around my teeth. <laughs> As a pastor, people expect me to have a, a silver tongue and to bring this great, incredible message of God's words to you. And, and I really work hard on that. And you, <laughs> but yet when I go and I and I, God, your grace has to cover this whole thing because I think that I just fell flat again. I don't think that I delivered the comfort that I needed. Or maybe, maybe you're the friend in the other direction. But understand that that works that way. But as we receive these words, we need to understand this. Don't put stock in everybody's words. Job's friends weren't evil after all. They did come for the right reasons of comfort and sympathy. They just didn't have the sufficient information. So understand that. They're not God. Okay, They're not bringing some new revelation to you. and Don't think of it that way. But we need to understand that these sorts of things will and can happen. And so, as we are receiving the counsel, choose your counselors very carefully. And filter the advice through prayer and common sense. I think Job did that. And he did a very good job at that, obviously. But there's a second piece of advice I want to bring to you, and it, it, it might sound kind of strange. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes, God's ways can confuse us. You say, well, wait a minute, God's not the author of confusion, and you're exactly right. God has it all figured out. He has all the plan. He has the journey mapped out for you, and we just need to continue to walk, even though we can't see anything around us at times. We need to continue to walk. But He's got it all figured out. He knows the depth of your pain. He knows the suffering. He feels it. He's there with you. He never leaves you. But sometimes we get confused. We get confused because we don't see it. We don't see what God sees. And quite frankly, if God was to spell it out for you, okay, Rodney, here's step one, boom, step two, boom, three, four, five, six, and on down through, the, I would look at it and say, whoa, wait a minute, where's this going? This doesn't even make sense. I wouldn't even understand it then. My mind is so polluted with sin and myself that I can't see beyond my nose. And so sometimes God's ways are confusing to me. His is perfect and holy and just and accurate and going in the direction it needs to go. And I am always going on the journey sideways. I get things mixed up all the time because I don't have the right perspective. I'm very much like Job's three friends. I have a philosophy that I base my life around, and sometimes it's not the right philosophy. Sure, I might mix a little theology in with it, but sometimes it just is not quite accurate. And so understand that sometimes God's way seems confusing, not because He's confusing, it's because I'm confusing. So don't expect to understand everything that happens. You cannot expect. Need to live with the tension. Need to live with tension. Are you good with tension? We can talk about tension in all sorts of aspects of our life. I, uh, I'm tempted to go down this trail, but we have tension. And um, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. We're going to get out of here before noon. And, and so we're going to do this. Your car has tension to it. Did you know that? You know that your car has tension? You look at anywhere on your car and there's tension. It, it, there, all the bolts and nuts are torqued down. 
There is tension on those bolts and nuts and the things that hold your car together. There's tension. If it wasn't tension, your car wouldn't be sitting where it is, probably. <laughs> It'd be laying around. Even inside the engine itself, there's great tension that goes on in there. You understand that? It's called internal combustion. There's a lot of tension going on there. If there were not tension, your car would not go down the road. If we did not have spiritual tension, our spiritual journey would not go down the road the way it needs to go. That's difficult to understand because I don't like tension. That's the opposite thing that I want. I want it to go nice. I want everything to be wonderful. I want to go in, in that car on Tuesday, and I don't want any hitches. I want the car to go down the road, and I want to get uh, through customs, and I want the, the airplane to arrive on time, and my luggage to go uh, with me over to Portugal, and I want a nice, comfortable bed. And I, and <laughs> Jay's laughing. Uh, and I want a nice, comfortable bed. I want everything to be wonderful. I want to be refreshed and everything, and I want to get back on the plane. I want to, everything. I want that. I don't want tension. What do you mean my luggage is lost? That's tension, and I don't need tension anymore in my life because don't you understand? I'm going to stretch so far I can't I take it anymore. Tension. We don't want tension, but it's the very things that keeps our wheels on the track spiritually. So understand, as we are thinking about tension, understand that there is tension on this side that pulls us and stretches us, and it's called the lack of understanding. We are stretched so far, so far, that it just comes out we are confused. God, what in the world are you doing? I don't understand. If you pull any more, I'm going to snap. Like that. But we have another tension that's working. That's bad enough. But it pulls us in the other direction, and it's silence from God. That's tension. And he pulls it, and he pulls it, and he pulls it because I don't hear anything. I don't know what he's doing in my life. I, 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 all I hear is silence. Do you hear silence? <laughs> and we're pulling in both directions. And we're just about ready to snap. And we feel that any second, one more thing drops on me, and that thing will snap, and it will blow up, and everything will fall apart. But it's this very tension this very tension that pulls in both directions that keeps me right where I need to be. I hope you can live with that. I hope somehow you can find peace in the midst of that tension. Because life, spiritual life specifically, is about tension. Do you praise God for the tension in your life? It's that very tension that keeps us on our knees, crawling forward. Job was doing that. And he didn't know what was going on. All he knew that he kept on going because God willed it. This morning we're going to do something really different. And by now, different is normal. <laughs> I'm going to pray. And then right after that, Dan's going to come and he's going to sing a song. And you may or may not know it, but the words will be up on the screen for you. And what I'm going to ask of you, I know that there are more than one of you out there that's going through something in their life. Some suffering. Some deep, dark times in which you're just like Job. And maybe it's, it comes in different directions. It comes at different levels. But yeah, you feel the tension. And you're being pulled in both directions. And you're hurting and you're suffering and you're in anguish. And really there's no comfort around you. And you seek the peace of God more than anything else in life. I'm going to ask you to come forward. And you could sit in one of these chairs up front here. And I don't know how God's going to move in this. But I know that God is, is working. I know that God, I know that there are people suffering. God's doing something in your journey of life. But I want you to just come. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is just pick yourself up, move yourself down to the front, any, any side. And just as Dan is singing, come and sit down. And you know what? I'm going to encourage the rest of you that are not moving to be a rubberneck. You know what a rubberneck is? When we took tests in school, we were told not to have a rubberneck. Looking over the shoulder, looking to see what's going on, looking to see the neighbor's answers, and don't, no rubbernecking. But here, rubberneck, please. 
It's your responsibility, church, to have a rubber neck this morning and to look to see who's sitting on this front row. Because what we're going to do this morning is after Dan's done singing, we as a church, we're going to rally around you. And we are going to be that friend to you that Job needed desperately. We're not going to sit here and we're not going to flog you with questions. We don't want to know all your business. But we are going to take mental note and we're going to pray for you this morning corporately. But also, people, church, I want you to understand, and even in your small groups, I want you to be praying for these people that come forward. And if God would even move move you even further, maybe even to give them some words of encouragement. Maybe you don't even understand all of what they're going through. You won't know what they're going through. The depths of suffering as we've been talking about. But please, pray for them. Encourage them. So, I'm going to pray. Dan will come, and then we'll move on from there. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank You for the day. I thank You for the opportunity to continue to study the life of Job. And God, I pray that if there's someone here today, and I know there's someone here today, several people, that is enduring suffering. Suffering where they're just stretched in all kinds of different directions and they're just about ready to snap. One more thing that gets put on them and they will snap. They will have a mental breakdown where they think. (laughs) So this morning they need to find peace. They need to find the peace of God in this tension. Because this tension is by your design. And so God, I pray that you would just work in a mighty way this morning to your glory. And I pray in Christ's name, amen. Isaiah 40. Um, verses 30 and 31 states this, Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Verse 31 goes on to say, But they who wait, that's a key word there, wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Somehow leaves us stronger when it's gone away. Pray. I try and pray for your will to be done. But I confess it's never fast enough for me, it seems. The hardest part is waiting. Just to see your hand move. I want a peace beyond my understanding. I want to feel it go like rain in the middle of my hurting. I want to feel your arms as they surround me. Let me know that it's
Thank you, brother. Okay, church. If you're not sitting on the front row, I want you to gather around these people. Okay, stand up. Be a church. Be a friend. Be a family. Just the best we can. And you, you folks that came forward, just stay seated. Just try to the best you can. Just stand in front of them, any, anything. Take a good look. Those sitting down. Burn it in your mind. They need you. They need you today. They need you for the journey. Not knowing where the journey is leading, not knowing where the journey is coming back or when it's going to end. But I challenge you to encourage them right today after we're done praying and pray in your small groups for these people and continue to pray for them. Encourage them. Send them a note. Do something. But let's be that encourager to our suffering brother and sister. Let's pray. Father, we come to You because You are the merciful, gracious, loving God. And we admit that we don't know what's going on. We know that. Our minds, our thoughts are so skewed with so many different things, and yet we have all of this suffering that's going on. And God, I pray that You would just Help these dear brothers and sisters to live with this tension, to find peace of God somehow, some way. And as they crawl along in this journey of life that You've given to them, help us to be the friends to encourage them. And if we don't know the right words to say, keep our mouths shut and just hug them, pray for them, Send them a note and let them know that you are praying for them. Help us to be those types of people. Those godly people 
that they desperately need. And God, I pray that in Your time, as You allow this dear servant of Yours to pass through this crucible, may You, Lord, be glorified. And may they come out of this crucible glorifying You as well. Coming out in a way that if they were not put into this, they would have never been that person. Oh God, we ask for Your will to be done. For You to be glorified this day. And we pray this all in the great name of Jesus. Amen.